All right, everyone. Hello and welcome to today's webinar. As I said previously, my name is Brian Payer. I am Senior Principal here at RMI in the Climate Aligned Industries Program. And on behalf of all of my colleagues across Climate Aligned Industries, across RMI, and our partners at Breakthrough Energy and ITIF, I'm honored to welcome you to today's webinar. So we're going to hear today about how to unlock some significant federal funding, um, more than $6 billion available in this particular grant program, which is yes, just a piece of the hundreds of billions of dollars that are available through this and other grants, tax incentives, and loan guarantees available uh, from the government. So what we're doing here specifically from the RMI perspective is it's our mission to drive deep industrial decarbonization in industry and to, to help uh, major capital projects that will uh, drive that decarbonization go. And so it's with programs like this, help to encourage and accelerate more projects to happen faster and with a higher ambition. And so we're here to support you, encourage you to apply, ideally demystify some of the processes uh, along the way. A disclaimer right up front that uh, refer back to all of the official publications from OCED from the funding opportunity announcement and the most current communications, those will always be the driving uh, driving answers um, and most up to date and current information. Also consult with uh, your legal tax and other specialist professionals for items that may be specific to your situation. Given today's large audience, uh, we will provide general remarks, but uh, we will not be attempting to provide any specific information to your project. Um, or uh, any specific elements like that. So from today's session, uh, if we move to the agenda, we will start with some opening remarks uh, from the White House Climate Policy Office to, to help set the scene of the, the broad uh, objectives, policy objectives around industrial carbon decarbonization. We, we also uh, have a speaker from the Department of Energy to again, provide some very high level, broad perspective about an overall picture for uh, for, for the program to drive um, industrial decarbonization. In the middle and the back half of today's webinar, we'll hear about uh, this specific funding opportunity announcement, um, including an overview of the, the grant itself, as well as some best practices on the timelines, eligibility and stipulations, and how to make sure your project qualifies, as well as how to tell your story in the appropriate format uh, and set yourself up for success. We'll also have a session dedicated to talking about community benefits planning, as that is one of the key evaluation criteria um, and one of the more frequently asked questions. Finally, we'll talk about partnering for success. Uh, it is most certainly a team sport to develop these projects, and a list of committed partners uh, makes for a stronger application. So uh, we'll also leave plenty of time towards the end for question and answer sessions to take some of the questions we've seen ahead of time. We also have the Q&A function live uh, as part of the, the Zoom here. So please do enter your questions into that Q&A panel um, and we will assemble that roster and start tackling those questions um, at the end of our planned presentation. So that is the plan for today. It is now my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Amar Badwaj, an industrial emissions fellow from the White House Climate Policy Office to offer us some opening remarks. So Amar, over to you. Thank you so much, Brian. And, and thank you for all the work that RMI is doing in, in bringing together such a, a great group of, of people today and to talk about a really critical topic on industrial decarbonization. So I wanna take a little bit of time off the top here to frame the administration's approach to industrial decarbonization and the importance of this moment for the, the sector that, that we're all working in. Uh, it, it's long been thought that the industrial sector is, is one of those sectors that is hard to decarbonize, uh, has been put on the back burner for a long time in broader decarbonization efforts. And this administration has really fundamentally changed that. Uh, we're investing historic amounts in industrial decarbonization technologies and deployment, and also sending a, a very strong demand signal for clean industrial products to match those investments. So with the, the work that President Biden and the administration uh, is doing on industrial decarbonization, we're really pulling the timeline for industrial decarbonization into this decade 
making things happen, putting steel into the ground now uh, to see some real payoffs uh, in this space. And I want to highlight that industrial decarbonization is not just a climate opportunity, though it is, and, and it accounts for a big portion of the, the overall pie that we're trying to shrink down in our work towards net zero emissions. But it's also a historic economic opportunity for companies that are involved and for revitalizing American manufacturing, bringing back uh, industrial vitality to this country and creating good paying jobs for the middle class and also boosting uh, America's standing on the global stage, sharpening our competitiveness in these critical industries of the future. So there, there's a lot of, at stake here and a lot of upside that we can unlock as a, a country, as a coordination across industry, communities, labor, and, uh, and government to, to really have some serious benefits from the industrial decarbonization work that we're leading on. Uh, the, and in particular, the infra infrastructure law, the IRA, uh, Chips and Science Act are providing a really unprecedented level of support from the federal government to help to spur these programs and accelerate industrial decarbonization in the, in the very near term. And I'll talk a little bit uh, about what we're doing in, in pulling forward those programs. We have a, a large set of tax credits, grants, and loans that are uh, coming to what you can truly say is an unprecedented level of investment from the federal government in industrial decarbonization in a real way. Uh, and as a, a highlight of those, we recently announced this last month, as many of us will know, the Industrial Demonstrations Program at DOE, which is uh, accounted for $6.3 billion, the single biggest investment in industrial decarbonization in American history uh, that will fund innovative projects at scale to decarbonize heavy industry across subsectors from steel to cement to chemicals and far beyond. We also have the $10 billion 48C manufacturing tax credit, which includes uh, as a subset of that credit, uh, an opportunity for projects that can reduce uh, industrial emissions by 20% or more in a, in a given facility. And, and that will help to boost energy manufacturing in the country and further accelerate industrial decarbonization. Also on, on the clean hydrogen front, we have plenty going on, uh, nothing short of game-changing investment in clean hydrogen through the 45V clean hydrogen production tax credit that could provide over $100 billion in incentives over its lifetime for the production of clean hydrogen and could make green hydrogen cheaper than conventional hydrogen in some parts of the country even today. And this will not only help to build out our capacity for making clean hydrogen here, but drive new end uses in decarbonizing manufacturing and heavy industry uh, in many of the sectors that we're here to talk about today. We also have the $8 billion clean hydrogen hubs program at DOE, which is a uh, going to help to show how we can integrate industry across the value chain from production through to delivery and end use and, and beyond that and, and show how that we can revitalize communities with this funding and, and really create a centralized model for how clean hydrogen can progress and, and accelerate industrial decarbonization and economic development in communities across the country. And with the application that we got from the hydrogen hub, we saw over $157 billion in total of private investment proposed uh, in, the, in the concept paper stage. And those projects were located across the country, showing a real breadth of uh, excitement and enthusiasm for these opportunities. And we're pairing those investments, these the historic investments, as I've said, in industrial decarbonization with the demand side pull as well. We're using the federal buy clean initiative that the president launched two years ago to send a very strong demand signal uh, using the federal government's $630 billion purchasing power to procure clean industrial materials, including steel, concrete, asphalt, and flat glass. And the federal government's the largest direct purchaser in the world and a major infrastructure funder through billions of dollars in grant programs. So this buy clean program is a real fundamental a market force in showing that if companies produce lower embodied emission materials on, in the industrial sector, there will be a buyer for them uh, in the federal government itself. Uh, so we're working across 14 federal agencies that represent 90% of federal purchasing of those materials to build out standards for the government to buy 
low embodied emissions materials. And we have over $4 billion from IRA at GSA and the Department of Transportation's Federal Highways Administration to uh, spur in a more direct funding mechanism clean material demand. Uh, and on top of the, the federal level uh, initiatives on public procurement, we're also working with the, the federal state buy clean partnerships that we launched uh, just uh, last month with a dozen leading states to also further the shared ambition across the country and harmonize market signals across governments. And on the, the private sector side for demand as well, we have the First Movers Coalition organized by uh, Secretary Kerry's team at the State Department that has secured nearly 100 private sector commitments for purchasing low emissions materials in the industrial sector. And that sums to $12 billion of uh, purchasing commitments for these near emission, near zero emissions products. So the industrial boom that was envisioned by President Biden when he took office is already underway with these programs that I'm laying out and, and with the, the payoffs that we're already seeing today. We've created 800,000 good paying manufacturing jobs since President Biden took office. Um, and the economic plan from the president has driven more than $300 billion in private sector investments in these industries of the future across the industrial sector, uh, electric vehicles, semiconductors, and so forth. And in addition, we have uh, in the pipeline over 12 million tons per year of clean hydrogen production that's under development already. So there is a real enthusiasm that we're seeing across the country for taking up the, the opportunities and the initiatives that the administration is putting into place. And we're really excited to see how we can pull this forward and finish the job, as we like to say, on delivering the real potential that we have in these programs. This is a decisive decade for climate action. And the only way that we're going to get over the finish line on these opportunities that we have is through partnership with industry, labor, communities, and including the, the coalition that RMI has brought together today to see where the synergies are between our different groups and leverage the administration's initiatives to, to spur a real transformative uh, new industrial policy uh, and outcome in this country. So thank you all for being here and, and I'm excited to, to see what we have going for the rest of the webinar. Thanks, Amr, very, very much appreciated on those uh, overview comments. There is a tremendous amount of activity going on. So thank you to you, uh, you and to your team for driving us forward. Uh, it is now my pleasure to uh, hand the mic to Kelly Visconti, who is the Acting Deputy Director for Facilities and Workforce at the Office of Manufacturing and Energy Supply Chains within the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, to again provide uh, some overview perspective. So Kelly, over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Amar and all of our colleagues in the White House for your leadership, support, and partnership in this really important endeavor. And thanks to RMI, Breakthrough, and ITF for putting on this event and the chance to speak with all of you today. Most importantly, thank you all for your interest in the Industrial Demonstration to Deployment Program uh, funding opportunity. We're incredibly excited about this and all of the work in the, across the U.S. government in industrial decarbonization. For those that don't meet, I now work in the Manufacturing Energy Supply Chain Office in the Department of Energy. I've been with DOE in the public sector about a decade and spent my first 10 years in the private sector in the chemicals industry, worked for an industrial gas company. In my short time with you today, I wanna to just provide a bit of an, a bigger picture overview of the industrial decarbonization work within the department and how this particular program fits into that. I wanna highlight some recent reports that might be of interest and a few other funding opportunities as well. With the realignment in the department last year and the creation of a new undersecretariat to help be able to best utilize and uh, put out the funding opportunities for the infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduct Reduction Act, there are many new offices and expanded programs within the department. And we'd like to talk through a few of those to help give you the bigger picture context. One of my roles is leading an internal coordination across the department, excuse me, an internal coordination effort across the department with my colleagues in the Industrial Efficiency and Decarbonization Office. We're working to really build on uh, existing analysis and develop an integrated industrial technology strategy that's going to help us strengthen US manufacturing and really achieve our decarbonization goals. 
One of our goals right now is to improve external communication and to make it easier for all of you to find the right programs, people, information, and resources across the department. It spans from foundational research, our national laboratory uh, capabilities and expertise, all the way through these large scale demonstration programs, as well as technical assistance and workforce development programs. So helping you all be able to find the information you need to do your work is something that we are looking to build out. So please stay tuned for that. In the meantime, a few key resources and opportunities that may be of interest as well. If you haven't seen them, well, the department recently published the Pathways to Commercial Liftoff. These reports are a great resource for related areas to industrial decarbonization. The first three reports were published on advanced nuclear, clean hydrogen, and long duration energy storage. The recorded launch webinar is also available on the DOE website. This first set of reports is really providing public and private sector stakeholders with a perspective as to how and when various technologies could reach full-scale commercial adoption. They include a common analytical fact base and critical signposts for investment decisions. So definitely check those out. You all are here for your interest in the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations. They've been working hard to launch many of the large-scale demonstration programs from the Infrastructure and IRA Act. And they are leading this industrial demonstrations to deployment program, the $6 billion. So I'm gonna point out the full webinar slides, the teaming partner list, the Q&A log, and all the other guidance is available on the DOE website, the OSED Exchange. Any questions to DOE on this, please go through the official FOA process. To tell you a little bit about my office and the work we're doing, in addition to coordinating across the department, our team also manages and implements many provisions to support domestic supply chains, the expansion, retrofit, and new capacity build out of manufacturing and industrial facilities. For example, our office supporting the Department of the Treasury in the implementation of the 48C tax credit Initial guidance has been issued and the first round of funding is anticipated to be available May 31st, 2023. We are also supporting the Advanced Energy Manufacturing and Recycling Grant Program, supporting small and medium-sized manufacturers to build and retrofit eligible facilities. There are some eligibility restrictions, but the first tranche of $350 million was issued and consultators have been uh, submitted. There will be a future funding opportunity for the remaining money of $400 million. So with the Loan Programs Office, the Office of Tech Transitions, the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, the Manufacturing Energy Supply Chain Office, State and Community Energy Programs, we are really collectively looking at this later stage demonstration to deployment opportunity and looking to address the remaining barriers to accelerating the adoption of efficiency and decarb solutions that are going to be ready in the next few years. In tandem, it is essential to build the innovation pipeline for new approaches and solutions. We are closely partnering with the Industrial Efficiency and Decarbonization Office, as well as other offices in our Undersecretary for Science and Innovation, from fossil energy to the Office of Science, nuclear energy, and others. Some highlights from the work there. Last fall, the department issued our industrial decarbonization roadmap. This is an excellent starting point for capturing all of the de essential developments that are needed to decarbonize these key energy intensive processes. The roadmap has been a guiding document and we are building on that for additional analysis and strategic planning. A few weeks later, last fall, the department launched its sixth energy earth shot. These energy earth, shot, earth shots, excuse me, are a bold decadal vision to developing decarbonization technologies, we launched the industrial heat shot that is setting a cost competitive process heat solutions with greater than 85% of greenhouse gas emissions reduction compared to today's technologies. We focused on process heating and is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions across all industrial sectors. We have to find alternative and cleaner ways to do materials transformations. The energy earthshots provide a common goal that really help us align and drive our research development and demonstration efforts. You will see uh, the industrial heat shot as a part of the FY23 industrial efficiency decarb $156 million funding opportunity for research and development. Concept papers are also due in the next few weeks. Um, other offices are going to be playing a key role across the department in achieving this goal from bioenergy office to our office of nuclear energy. 
One thing I also wanted to highlight is in addition to working with the DOE offices directly, our national laboratories are another great set of resources and the lab partnering service, there'll be a website link and the resources page later on, may also be useful to you in thinking about the right expertise, maybe tests and validation facilities and other capabilities like our high performance computing that the department has to offer that may be of interest and benefit to you. So I hope you wait, walk away from this short talk with just uh, use some useful information and knowing that we in the department are finding ways to maximize the opportunity we have with the funding at hand, as well as planning for the future. To achieve our collective goals of a strong, equitable economy that is cleaner and more sustainable, we all have to work together. I look forward to future engagement and thank you so much for your time and kind attention. I think Brian, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, again, truly appreciate your leadership uh, and there's just such a tremendous volume of action and activity and funding and dollar support uh, and resource support that is available through this, uh, this full suite of programs. Um, again, there will be a resources slide coming later in the deck and, and as part of the follow-up. So uh, for those of you that were not busy scribbling down all of the notes of all the programs that Kelly and, and Amar uh, mentioned, there, there will be links um, available. So uh, once again, Kelly, thank you to you and your colleagues for your leadership, much appreciated. Uh, at this point, we are going to turn uh, over to my colleague, Hartej Singh, who is a manager within our Climate Line Industries program. And Hartej is going to dive into um, a brief orientation about the, the, the grant parameters under this indus industrial decarbonization grant, um, as well as some best practices about how you can put together uh, a very strong concept paper um, for this grant. So Hartej, over to you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we'll get into uh, the content then. Next slide, please. So before I embark on my remarks, I just want to reemphasize that uh, the official webinar uh, is up on the OSED website, and, and you can also access the official funding opportunity announcement document. Uh, I just want to say that uh, for all official guidelines and, and questions, please reference these resources. Uh, there's a plethora of resources. There's question and answer documents as well that are published on the OSED website. So uh, definitely please do leverage those resources. Next slide, please. So for just a high level overview, before we get into the, the details, uh, 6.3 billion in grants um, to fund first and early of a kind projects uh, was just unveiled recently last month by the Department of Energy. So these are targeting new technologies that have been proven at a pilot scale, but have yet to be commercially demonstrated. So think TRL seven to nine. These are also technologies that are being pursued internationally, but don't necessarily have a foothold in the US. And, and these also include early of a kind projects that face market or adoption risks. So projects under this funding opportunity announcement should be commercially, uh, should be a commercial scale or commercially relevant include a path from demonstration to deployment that includes operations after completion as well, and have the goal of enabling widespread non-federally funded follow-on investment after the project period. So if you're an organization, you just completed your pilot project and you're looking for ways to fund commercial deployment, uh, this opportunity could be for you. And we'll talk a bit, a bit more about the criteria for this funding opportunity in the slides to come. Next slide, please. So before we get into uh, breaking down what's required for the submission, let's talk some best practices. So first, from the concept paper side, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, it's important to know your timelines and requirements. So seemingly simple items like on-time concept paper submission, uh, SAM.gov registration, and uh, submission portal registration often get missed. You don't want to be sitting there at, at, on, uh, at 4.59 uh, p.m. Eastern time on April 21st and just then uh, doing your registration on OSED uh, exchange. Uh, so definitely do that well in advance. You also wanna perform a legal check and, and see how your uh, legal and eligibility requirements line up with what's documented in the FOA. You wanna do that as early as possible in case there's any long lead time items. You wanna be familiar with cost share requirements and how the applicant will split funding amongst project partners. 
Um, and you want to be familiar with some of the tools you're going to have to engage in, in as you put together your full application. So uh, tools to calculate LCA and establishing which partner has life cycle cost uh, and emissions analysis in their scope. That's all very important things to do early on. And on the project formation side, if you look on the right hand side of the screen, establishing a governance structure between uh, the prime contractors and the project partners for each item in the scope of work, you should set that up as early as possible. Gain clarity on the finance structure. So thinking about, you know, what is your project's reliance on grant funding for project success? Um, as you progress through refining your, your carbon intensity emissions reductions and your LCA, make your emissions boundary as, as clear as possible, such that it's clear to the reviewer that you're not moving emissions from one part of the supply chain to another. And then finally, identify project risks and impact to timeline. Um, examples such as your reliance on external infrastructure, um, just to highlight one. Our recommendation is that you create a risk matrix where you risk, uh, you list the risk, you the potential likelihood and impact, uh, so low, medium, or high, and you propose a mitigation. Um, so just to give you a perspective on some best practices on the project formation and concept paper side. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna talk a bit about the topics uh, in this specific funding opportunity announcement. Um, and I wanna uh, preface my comments by saying that all of the values on this slide are anticipated and I encourage you to monitor the Department of Energy website and official funding opportunity announcement for all official numbers and updates. Um, so the first topic area is looking at world leading first or early of a kind full facility build outs resulting in significant emissions reductions up to net zero operations. The anticipated amount per award is going to be 100 to 250 million. The anticipated number of awards is two to five, and the award duration uh, is eight to 12 years. Topic two is looking at large scale overhauls for existing facilities, common technologies across multiple facilities, or new builds with, with accelerated planning, development, permitting, and financing strategies. This is looking at uh, 75 to 100, 500 million uh, per award, looking at awarding 10 to 30 projects and an award duration of three to seven years. And then finally, you have topic three, which is looking at upgrades, retrofits, and operational improvements that target decarbonization within a unit operation or process line at an existing facility, anticipated amount per award of 35 to 75 million, 10 to 30 projects are uh, anticipated being awarded, and a war duration of three to seven years as well. And I wanna highlight, we'll, we'll talk a bit more about cost share on the next slide, but uh, I wanna highlight that all projects are going to require at least 50% cost share. Next slide, please. So I wanna help everyone on the line answer the question, uh, does my project qualify? So starting with this slide, we're gonna, you know, it's important for you to consider the DOE priority themes, areas of interest and target metrics. So working from the left-hand side of the screen all the way to the right, uh, the themes of interest for DOE are deep decarbonization, timeliness, market viability, and community benefits. We'll touch a bit more on each of these pillars in a slide to come. Areas of interest. So uh, I want to preface my comments by saying that applications are not limited to the industries listed on the screen here. Um, but just to give a couple of, of examples of, of areas of interest in this particular funding opportunity, we're looking at iron, steel, and steel mill products, aluminum, cement and concrete, glass, pulp and paper, industrial ceramics, chemicals and refining, other cross-cutting opportunities, and other in energy intensive industrial sectors. And then target metrics. Um, so reducing carbon intensity is a very, very critical metric here um, in, in DOE's interest. So each topic has its own a target and stretch target uh, metrics for carbon intensity reduction. Um, and there are other metrics that are of interest for the DOE. So the more metrics you can discuss in your concept paper and your full application and, and show how you seek to address your targets, uh, the better. Next slide, please. So uh, this is part two of answering the question of how does my project qualify? So, uh, you know, starting on the left-hand side of the screen here, you as the prime recipient, uh, you must meet the applicable eligibility requirements as defined in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the Inflation Reduction Act provisions. And those specific provisions are shown in the table below. So please do reference these and, and ensure that you as the prime recipient uh, meet all applicable requirements. Secondly. 
partners. So the Department of Energy encourages all applicants to strengthen your, your projects and your applications by partnering with experts, universities, labor unions, community-based organizations, NGOs, off-takers, and national labs, just to list a few. Uh, the stronger of a cohort or consortium you can bring together, the more it will reflect favorably when you're putting together that application and it eventually gets reviewed. So definitely encourage everyone on the line to uh, partner uh, with all sorts of stakeholder groups uh, that you see listed here and those that are not listed here as well. And then on cost share, um, so it's important to highlight that federal financing, such as the Department of Energy Loan Program Office loan guarantees, cannot be leveraged by applicants to provide the required cost share or cover the same scope that is proposed in your application. And that deferred costs and avoided costs, such as tax credits, can't be used as cost share either. I um, want to highlight, however, that uh, cost share with in-kind contributions, uh, such as labor, to give one example, are possible. And that pre-award costs are allowable if prior written consent is obtained. Uh, to give an example around cost share, I did mention that cost share must be at least 50% of total project costs. So to give an example, as you see on the bottom of the screen here, if you have a project where the total costs are 300 million, the project partners as the applicants must provide 150 million in cost share at a minimum for this specific opportunity. Next slide, please. So these are the four pillars that I mentioned. Um, so uh, we'll, get into, we'll read this verbatim here, but the four pillars are deep decarbonization, timeliness, market viability, and community benefits. Um, starting from the bottom up, community benefits we're going to uh, touch on in, in greater depth later in this presentation, so I'll be very short on that. On market viability, essentially what the Department of Energy is looking for is that uh, your solution triggers follow-on investment uh, beyond uh, what's, what's funded in the project period. So that's the critical uh, item there. Timeliness, uh, the Department of Energy is looking for uh, addressing emissions in the near term. So, uh, you know, highlighting when your project's going to be operational and, and start uh, reducing emissions is very important. And then uh, deep decarbonization, um, you know, showing that your project leads to a significant carbon intensity reduction compared to the current state of the art is, is critically important. So if you can make uh, it as easy as possible for the application reviewer to, to see that you're hitting these four pillars, uh, that will bode well for your concept paper and your full application. Next slide, please. Um, touching a bit on timeline. So today we're uh, at April 10th. Uh, the concept paper is due on April 21st at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, shortly thereafter, encourage dis discourage notifications are gonna be issued by the Department of Energy. And then uh, fast forwarding a bit, the full applications are due August 4th, 2023 at 5 p.m. Eastern. And anticipated selections are, are going to be uh, later this year or early 2024. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, different components of the concept paper. So now we're going to break down the concept paper into its uh, constituent parts and discuss those uh, in a bit greater detail. Uh, I think uh, you'll hear a common theme here um, is making it as easy as possible for the reviewer. Um, so you want to use the structure outlined in the FOA as your guide. Uh, for example, if a if the FOA says that you know a, details a few bullets uh, that are requirements in in the concept paper, use those as subheadings within the concept paper and make it as clear as possible for the reviewer as they're reviewing your concept paper. So in the concept paper, there's a cover page, a project plan and team description, community benefits plan, and a management or organization uh, plan. And you see the maximum page limits on each of these, um, totaling to a 10-page maximum concept paper. And I encourage you to please review the official funding opportunity announcement for, for guidelines around format, um, graphics tables, and you want, really want to make sure you're ensuring compliance with all the details listed in the FOA. Next slide, please. Concept paper, pretty simple, but don't want to make you want to make sure that you're not missing any of these components. Got to include your project title, your topic area, your industry sector in which your project is going to be demonstrated, your area of interest, your technical and business points of contact uh, for you as the prime applicant, and the names of all team member organizations, the project location, and any statements regarding confidentiality. And definitely want to uh, refer you to se section 8.1 of the funding opportunity announcement for more details there. Next slide. 
So project plan and uh, project team description. So if we're just looking at it from a page number perspective, uh, this represents uh, if you if you meet the maximums, uh, about 60% of your concept paper. So uh, a lot of the important content is going to go here. Um, so starting from the bottom up, uh, I'm not going to read this verbatim, but I want to give you some highlights. Um, in your project plan and project team description, you want to make sure you're highlighting the carbon intensity reductions of your project. You want to show how your project is going to stimulate follow-on funding. You want to highlight the replicability of your project and that it catalyzes industry-wide change. You want to highlight the impact that DOE funding would have on the proposed project. You want to highlight the timeline and key risks and how you seek to address those risks. And then finally, you want to touch on your technology. What is innovative, innovative about your technology and your approach? So uh, definitely, uh, please do read this in detail, uh, these requirements in the funding opportunity announcement. But uh, this just provides you a uh, brief highlight of what this uh, part of the concept paper entails. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, the management organization uh, section is where you highlight your qualifications as the prime and uh, uh, the qualifications of your project partners. So you want to show you have the skills and expertise uh, to, to execute this project, that you have experience uh, executing projects of similar risk and complexity. You want to tell the DOE whether you and your project partners have a history of working together and, and what projects have you successfully completed in the past. And uh, finally, you want to show that you have adequate access to resources. So things like financing, equipment, your facilities, your site, your workforce, uh, things of that sort. And in this section, important to note that you must include a summary org chart uh, in this section. Next slide, please. Thank you. So I won't read this verbatim, uh, but uh, just wanted to highlight here uh, that the DOE does have an evaluation criteria for your concept paper. Um, all of these uh, evaluation criteria that you see on the screen here are listed in the official funding opportunity announcement. And a uh, reoccurring theme, uh, you want to make it as easy as possible for the reviewer of your concept paper. So, um, you know, things like uh, labeling clearly where, um, you know, uh, creating a matrix where you, you, you use the evaluation criteria potentially as a subheading or in the body of the text itself in the concept paper will make it abundantly clear to the reviewer of your concept paper that you're meeting that eligibility, uh, that evaluation criteria, I should say. So make it as easy as possible. Um, overlying theme here. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Hadia Shirazi, who's going to talk to you about the community benefits uh, and best practices. Hadia? Thank you, Artesh. As we've heard, this FOA is an unprecedented opportunity to remediate socioeconomic and health burdens on generations of low income communities and communities of color that have been historically marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by legacy pollution and underinvestment. Next slide, please. I'm going to highlight some best practices, tools, and strategies to help you get started with thoughtful and responsive community benefits planning and analysis for this concept paper. Please refer to the two FOA resources on the slide for highly detailed step-by-step -step guidelines. Next slide, please. The FOA lists five key requirements for the community benefits section, supporting meaningful and commun community and labor engagement, investing in the American workforce by supporting quality jobs, advancing diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, contributing to the goals of the Justice 40 initiative that require 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments to flow to disadvantaged communities that are marginalized, underserved, and overburdened by pollution. And finally, Section 501-61D2 of the Inflation Reduction Act that specifies priority consideration for the extent to which the project would provide the greatest benefit for the greatest number of people within the area in which the eligible facility is located. Plans will be evaluated on the strategies for accomplishing each requirement and methods to ensure accountability. Next slide, please. So minding the two page limit, applicants should aim to write about a paragraph for each of the five sections, outlining the vision for each requirement discussing the results of stakeholder mapping and analysis, and I'll say more about that in a minute, identifying clear goals with measurable outcomes, highlighting relevant metrics and timelines for implementation, 
as well as your plans for transparency and accountability to impacted communities. Please note that this FOA specifically asks applicants to address localized impacts related to changes in air pollution, including NOx, SOx, PM2.5, etc., water pollution, hazardous waste streams, and the creation or retention of local quality jobs. Next slide, please. The FOA guidelines note that there is no single process for generating engagement, workforce, DEIA, or Justice 40 plans. Successful plans will iterate and evolve throughout the project lifecycle and be responsive to community input, needs, and existing burdens. The first section should address plans and actions to engage and partner with disadvantaged communities that are most impacted by and vulnerable to project development. Surrounding frontline or fenceline communities adjacent to the development, labor unions, and any federally recognized tribal entities. Please note that the DOE is and remains responsible for government to government consultation with any federally recognized tribal entities. The second and third sections should describe plans to create quality jobs to build the skilled workforce needed for our long term energy transition goals and ensure compliance with civil rights and non discrimination laws to ensure inclusive workplaces. For the fourth section, applicants should describe the type and magnitude of benefits that will flow to communities in the area where eligible facility or facilities are located. And lastly, for the Justice 40 section, provide an overview of all potential benefits to disadvantaged communities and how you will quantify, measure and track these benefits across the full life cycle. Note that project impacts can be positive, neutral or uncertain or negative. Next slide, please. For each project site, here is a list of federal and state census level analytical tools to help you identify all communities and groups that may be impacted by your project. You can use any format to describe your findings, but please do remember to mention which tool or tools you utilize in your analysis. Next slide, please. If you are new to using these types of tools, here are some great online tutorials and how to guides to help you. Next slide, please. Stakeholder mapping is a great exercise for getting to know the area to gain insights into the historical, socioeconomic, cultural, and environmental landscape, the local decision-making structures and power dynamics, especially understanding your company's history, if any, with the project's impacted area and groups. Please also remember to identify all labor groups and unions supporting on-site and off-site activities, and remember to identify workers and unions representing those workers whose jobs may be lost or displaced by the project. Next slide, please. Plans for community engagement should be focused on relationship building that leads to working partnerships and building accountability. Applicants should listen to and engage all relevant stakeholders impacted by project development, especially traditionally excluded groups. Ideally, you would get the community's feedback on how to engage with them to avoid unduly burdening them. Secondly, good assessments will account for all affected areas. The site, plus critical inputs like water, labor, transportation routes, supply chains, et cetera. Third, developers should use a mix of informal methods of engagement, noting that different groups may have different accessibility needs, such as facilitation in multiple languages, the need for transportation, childcare, or virtual options. Do utilize two-way engagements to incorporate community feedback into project decision-making. Remember to follow up on any unanswered questions and summarize and circulate notes after engagements for clarity and transparency. Lastly, bring in credible third parties like national labs to weigh in on information being provided to all stakeholders during your engagements. Thank you and back to you, Brian. Well, thank you, Hadia, and thank you, Harkesh, for going through that uh, that information. So to the participants, hopefully that is helpful to demystify parts of the process and provide you some uh, good, practical, tactical advice as you are writing up your concept papers. At this point, we're going to uh, invite Ed Ryder, who's the director of the Center for Clean Energy Innovation at ITIF, 
to uh, provide some perspective on uh, what uh, what's what's the big picture here. So uh, we'll have Ed give us some thoughts. Over to you, sir. Okay, super. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> I, I guess looking back at uh, three decades in industry and co-leadership of the industrial decarbonization roadmap that Kelly mentioned, and having an early hand in the development of this concept for this program, I'll highlight a, a couple of um, items that I think are critical to success on the next slide. One is scale. Uh, the impact of the greenhouse gas reductions is a prime driver for this program. And as those technologies are developed, there's multiple ways that one can demonstrate scale. I've listed a couple here. It's also important as you establish partnerships to think about how those partnerships can deliver the greatest value possible, not only in greenhouse gas reductions, but also for the program uh, participants that will be in these partnerships, because that will continue to have the partnerships uh, continue to deliver the opportunity uh, that we're driving for. I'll also note that it's very important here to drive cost parity of these technology solutions. For without cost parity, uh, that is where they're providing the same performance and also delivering the same cost or same price, uh, the adoption of these technologies will be very slow. In fact, we want the adoption to be very fast and we want the adoption to be global. So the technology solutions that you're looking for, a prime driver is to reduce the cost of those solutions for you and the others around the globe that might pick up those technologies. I'll also note that alignment is really important with the partners uh, in this space. Uh, there needs to be mutual risk uh, and reward. It's important to, again, get the cost down to drive competitiveness as you look for new markets and to develop new infrastructure that will be essential for industry to compete in the future. Lastly, I'll note that workforce is a really uh, large component of this opportunity. Uh, collaborators across supply chains, across small and medium-sized manufacturers. It's an opportunity to bring in some partners here that will help you in the long run. And of course, it's also important to have uh, communication that's transparent uh, and something that is uh, involved in the decision-making for not only the FOA, but for the process itself that will drive these technologies to fruition. And with that, I'll hand it to Abigail Rosicki. Thanks, Ed. Uh, and thanks everyone again for joining us uh, in this kind of theme of partnerships and building strong applications. Um, some of you in the audience uh, may be participating in Breakthrough Energy's uh, matchmaking facilitation for this particular um, funding opportunity. So, so thank you for joining us and participating in that. Um, I also want to invite now uh, a bit of starting to participate in um, the webinar. I think we have a poll um, that we're able to show. Um, so hopefully we can launch the poll and see uh, and get a sense from all of you um, what you kind of need um, most help with um, on your application process. Uh, so please um, go ahead and answer the poll um, and then we'll uh, take a look at the results um, in a second. Um, so while you all are filling that out, um, just wanted to go over some of the types of um, organizations that are available that are out there uh, to partner on this application and others. So whether that's uh, on the technology side, um, if you are looking for technology solutions for your facility, um, that's something that, that Breakthrough Energy has been trying to help facilitate uh, matchmaking between existing facilities as well as uh, and startups and solutions providers. Um, think about to combining multiple solutions for a single facility to really get at those deeper emissions reductions, again, that deep decarbonization pillar um, that Hartesh mentioned on um, the kind of the more that you can do that, I think the more that you can demonstrate um, to DOE the, the usefulness of, of the project um, in really reaching those deep um, emissions reductions. Um, definitely look at engineering, procurement, and contracting um, 
providers as well as technology licensors um, and venture portfolios for looking for startups. Um, the national labs have already been mentioned several times now. They could be really helpful for the types of analyses like techno-economic analyses and life cycle assessments, which are both going to be required um, in the application process. Um, so definitely something to consider there, as well as universities, again, for some of the analysis um, and, and kind of just looking through the options there, help with the application um, and uh, involving, you know, if uh, a local university um, as well to the project site could be certainly a way to involve uh, more local um, project participants. Then uh, you may have noticed that market viability and demand or offtake is another key criterion that DOE is looking at. Um, so definitely think about uh, other existing programs that uh, Amar mentioned that the federal government is doing related to buy clean of many of these materials. Um, like uh, steel, uh, cement concrete, um, and uh, you'll note that all of these federal programs are now pointing to environmental product declarations or EPDs as the method of showing um, that the product that you are manufacturing certainly uh, does actually have uh, lower emissions in the processing. So uh, if you already have an EPD for your facility now, um, and if you don't certainly uh, mention that you will get an EPD for your facility once it is built, once you've done the retrofit, to, you know, lower the emissions in those process, I think will go a long way. Um, then looking at uh, some of the other private sector uh, attempts that have also been mentioned on kind of creating demand or offtake, the First Movers Coalition, Steel Zero, Concrete Zero, just a couple of examples. Um, you know, taking a look at what their requirements are, what the goals they have set for those participants on the emissions intensity of the products that they want to purchase. And if you can show that, you know, your facility is going to be meeting um, those requirements, then I think that's a, a good demonstration of, uh, you know, demand uh, that will be there once uh, you uh, make those improvements. Um, and of course, direct engagement with buyers. Um, you may already be having these types of conversations. Um, if it's possible to have the buyer more directly involved in the application, um, be able to, you know, go so far as to um, use an agreement uh, you know, or contract for offtake and submit that with the application, that will certainly go a long way um, in meeting this criterion. Um, in uh, continuing to think about um, local organizations and labor, uh, as uh, Hadia mentioned, the importance of doing that engagement, but even going beyond engaging them, you know, inviting them to be part of the application itself. Um, if you can find a local organization that's excited about your project, um, that could be a really good indication um, to DOE of a strong project if not only are you showing how you're going to engage the community, but showing that pieces of the community um, are, are actually actively involved uh, in the project itself and the application. Um, and then finally, just uh, a reminder that there are many consultants out there whose jobs are to help people like you apply for this type of funding. Um, there are community engagement specialists. There are you know, lawyers who specialize in community benefits agreements, which you know, is one way to clearly show benefits to a community. Um, there are other um, firms who specifically uh, help companies apply to grant programs and this type of funding, as well as other investment and financing firms uh, who can help you know, on the financial side and uh, also just be uh, kind of further partners in, in these types of large projects. So that's just uh, a bit of some other ideas for partnerships. Again, really encouraging folks to kind of build a strong team for these applications um, and that you, know, you should start now with these teams, have that demonstrated in the concept paper. But then of course, um, I think you can continue to, to build that out as, as needed for the full applications as well. So I think maybe we can show the poll results now if that's possible. If not, I'm sure we can get to that later. <laughs> All yeah. right. Uh, 
Great. So I think uh, if folks can see this, it looks like a lot of help is needed on the community benefits plan. I think we've heard that. So that's no surprise. So hopefully some of the information that Hadia shared, as well as many of the resources that she shared that will be again shared um, with these slides will be helpful. Um, but again, there are people whose jobs are to help you with this. Um, and if those are contacts um, that would be helpful, um, definitely feel free to flag that that for, for our team offline, uh, anyone on, on the webinar team here, um, and we can certainly help out with that. Um, it looks like finance, market viability, and offtake was uh, kind of the second most um, uh, needed piece. So again, um, that is something that I encourage you to look at existing, um, you know, what the federal government is doing in that space, um, existing private sector kind of action and, and kind of pooling of buyer um, procurement um, for some of these materials as, as a start. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think with that, I will go ahead and turn it back to Brian. Thanks, Abigail and Ed. Really appreciate your perspectives here and all of the work that you and your teams have been doing to provide information, provide support, provide encouragement to the uh, the various participants um, across the industry here. And um, Ed, in particular, appreciate your you know big picture perspective about how we can move these things forward, um, as well as the tremendous amount of uh, resources and uh, in in partnering. Um, you can see on the screen here that, that we do have uh, quite a bit of items that are uh, available for follow-up. We do plan to um, provide this and uh, in, in this information in these slides available to folks after uh, the webinar and a follow-up. You um, should also note that this webinar uh, has been recorded, so if there are any great sections that you would like to put into your video streaming queue, uh, we will post that. Um, after it gets through post-production, and you can um, have that to refer back to any and all of this information um, over the next uh, couple of weeks as you finish up your concept paper. So I, we can go to the next slide here. The, the That ends our formal prepared remarks, and we now have time available for Q&A. Um, so we have, uh, we have a Q&A function. We've had uh, quite a few questions come in during the session here, would encourage you all to please keep using the Q&A um, Q&A section um, element uh, as as this goes through. So I've got a roster here. So I'll I'll serve as the uh, moderator and call up a couple of folks to answer a couple of questions. So um, Hadia, we'll go to some to to you first with a couple of community benefits. Uh, planning related questions as the poll uh, suggested. This is an area where folks want to know um, several items. So uh, one question is, are there clear metrics for measurement of a successful community benefits plan? For example, how many community groups does a project need to engage? How many jobs does the project need to create per dollar of funding or, or any other metrics like that or, or guidance that you can speak to? Thanks, Brian. I think it's a great question. Um, the OSAD exchange page has this 60-page um, guidelines. It's almost like a little manual, um, which I expect by the end of this, this submission will be really well thumbed for everyone that's applying. I would recommend going through um, the subsections for each of the five requirements to look up the you know, what is a good community benefits program? How do I know that I've got a good Justice 40 section? They literally have subheadings that go into that level of detail with example milestones that are actually fully built out. And so in our slide deck at the very end, they, I have included, I believe five slides with the page numbers for each section that identifies exactly those metrics. So I hope that the once the slide deck is available to everyone, they will refer to that as well as the original OSED guidelines document. Thanks, Hadia. And uh, we've got a, another um, community benefits related question here. Um, and I'll, I'll read this one uh, to you and also invite uh, Ben Beachy from BGA, who's the, the VP of uh, industrial uh, industrials 
Um, if you'd like to add any secondary comments on this, Ben, then in perspective, please do. And the, the question is, regarding community benefits planning, what percentage of the program budget is typically allocated to the community benefits plan portion of the project, or if there's any if there's any kind of guidance on on a dollar metric figure, or if that is really up to the applicant to specify uh, what they think is necessary. I don't know if Ben is still uh, looking to join, but I do want to mention that the um, percentage, or I, I believe if they're, if they're referencing the 40% of the benefits, that's not actually um, going to be the funding or the federal funding, that that, that percentage does not apply to that. It's actually um, the benefits from the project itself. And so that can be negotiated with the communities um, and can look like things like, for instance, um, providing air quality monitoring in neighborhoods that have high levels of uh, criteria pollutants. And so investing in creating an air quality monitoring program that, that the local community is able to, to participate in as well. Um, so some of those, uh, that the cost of that would go towards that, you know, percentage of 40% benefits. That's like one example. Got it. Can you hear me now? Hey, Ben. Hey. Yes, we got you. Sorry, I was having some tech difficulties. Um, yeah, I agreed with what Haya said. Um, you know, it's pretty critical. I think it's it's we have not engaged a lot on details of like what actual portion of the private investment would go uh, towards the community benefits. If you have those numbers, I think that's useful. At least as important though is some of the things that Hadia named about process, um, naming that, uh, namely that you are engaging early and meaningfully with communities. You know, there's been I think a spectrum of experiences um, when it comes to community benefit agreements. Um, some of which have been perceived by community groups as more of a box checking exercise at the end of a process. Um, and that is not what is being asked for, of course. Um, and so to the extent that you can lay out very clearly that there's going to be early and meaningful engagement in the design phase um, with impacted community groups, I think that would be really important. Um, that you have a full panoply of players in, in, named, um, so namely uh, unions, uh, uh, just to you know, partnerships were of course emphasized before, but just to state it explicitly, partnering with a union um, will certainly better position uh, your, your application. Um, partnering with local environmental justice groups and other impacted groups as well. Um, and that uh, the, the reason uh, for that is you can go back to what Hadia named that the local benefits calculation is going to include um, to what extent the jobs created are high quality jobs. So unions will help with that argument. Um, to what extent uh, is it not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also local pollution. And so partnership with local environmental justice groups would help to that end. So I'd say at least as important as the how much is the with whom and when. So early in, uh, in the process with unions, environmental justice groups and other impacted community groups. And then the last thing I would name is that um, that it actually be a binding agreement, right? Um, so that community benefit agreements can take different forms. Um, you can have basically a hortatory document that amounts to like a promissory note. That is not what Department of Energy is calling for here, as we understand it. Um, it, it is a legally binding agreement with community groups. Um, and so to the extent possible, you can actually state that uh, as the intention in the concept paper that we intend to um, work early uh, in the design phase uh, with community groups, including unions, EJ groups, and others. And we intend at the end of the process to sign a legally binding agreement with them. Um, I think that would serve you well. Great. Uh, thank you for that valuable perspective, both Heidi and Ben, on what goes into these plans and, and help that we um, help, uh, hope that that can help the applicants out here uh, make some sense of their community benefits plan. And, you know, I'll just uh, refer back to the point of for the concept paper, it's two pages and it's, you know, use the headings to your advantage um, to drive, uh, drive your thinking around this. Um, and look ahead to the full application phase. The full application phase is a 25 page section, again, 
well spelled out with the headings and the documentation that you will need um, to uh, to go through and address that and engage with the communities and uh, around you. Um, I'm going to uh, take another group of questions now. Um, there were several logistical uh, questions and qualification questions and timeline questions. So I want to uh, bring those back up. And uh, if I could ask the slides to get shared back to the timeline slide that we have, please, for the application phase um, and deadlines. Um, while we're pulling that back up, just so everyone can, can look at the deadlines, um, there were questions about is an extension possible and uh, we have not seen anything in our review that says an extension is possible so we would uh, put these uh, treat these deadlines as real deadlines to to work towards on certainly on the concept paper being due um, the encourage discourage notifications does not have a specific date uh, uh, out here but um, you can kind of see just at least roughly where it, where it's placed on there um, when do, DOE is looking to uh, provide those encourage, dis discourage notifications with uh, a fair amount of time before the final applications um, are, are due. So again, refer back to the OSED webpage for any updates, any changes uh, when it comes to uh, any of these dates and, and submissions, but treat these as hard deadlines for each and every um, each and every segment. So uh, with with the deadline, there were a couple questions that were related to who who qualifies um, and uh, and what the you know where does my project fit. And so, you know, one one question was, um, and this is going to be for Hartej, I'm going to tee you up for a couple couple questions here. So first up is how exact must the match be between the topic areas in the FOA and the proposed technology? And, and is there any wiggle room uh, within those topical definitions? Hey Brian, uh, great question. Um, so I'll say this. So the FOA does explicitly say that it is not, submissions are not limited to the industries that are listed. Um, I'll mention that first. And I'll also say, it's also mentioned that other energy intensive industrial sectors are of interest uh, to the DOE. That being said, I think it is in the applicant's best interest to show an applicability to the specific sectors that are listed if it's possible. So if your technology or project has an applicability to, let's just pick an example, the cement or concrete, in, concrete industry, which is explicitly listed in this FOA, then you should definitely state that uh, because that's a clear area of interest that the DOE has, has, has marked. Um, if you're going in under the other in, energy intensive industrial sectors, you should make the case why that industrial sector that wasn't explicitly listed is in need of a solution and how your solution seeks to reduce the carbon intensity of the current state of the art from the current state of the art. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate that insight there, Hartej. And I'm gonna call on Ed um, as well to answer a, a similar type of question here. And, and Ed, could you, describe some of the technologies that may be considered transformative versus incremental and, and perhaps expound upon some of, you know, some of your previous remarks about what's going to fit in this, uh, this type of grant program. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, transformative uh, means uh, many different things. Um, it can be including uh, changing a process, the way that the materials are made, so that they're made in a way that is much lower carbon to begin with. It can be also greatly reducing the intensity of the, the carbon that's used to make a product. For example, it could be uh, completely switching uh, away from fossil fuels. It can be also changing uh, the process heat, as process heat accounts for more than 50% of the on-site energy use uh, in industry. So I, I think what's really uh, important here is that it dramatically reduces the greenhouse gas emissions. 
Uh, and that can also be related to the carbon intensity of the products made. Uh, and also, I would say that um, it's also something that can uh, reduce the carbon intensity across the entire supply chain uh, as well. Uh, that's where material efficiency uh, comes in uh, as, as one of the pillars uh, in the industrial decarbonization roadmap. So just to wrap that up, I say transformative is something that greatly reduces the carbon intensity of the production process itself or its use of, of energy. Thanks. Thanks, Ed. And I would encourage, again, all the, the folks on the line here, there's a pretty extensive Q&A document that the uh, that, that's posted on the BOA website that OSED has gone in and answered questions there. I, there are several that talk about the topic area, the types of projects, the types of industry, the, the level of ambition and emissions reductions that are that are expected. Um, and it's it's kind of a handy cheat sheet for going through the, the FOA itself as they provide a lot of uh, links back to in specific page references to where you know they, the, the DOE describes in detail what they are and aren't looking for. So um, that's another uh, place for folks to go uh, go check on. Um, I've got uh, two here that I, I'm going to um, tee up for Hartej uh, as well. Um, uh, and you know, a related uh, related ones on again, some logistics and eligibility. So the first is, What's the expectation for the level of detail required for the business model, financial plan, um, and concept paper? So in, in the concept paper, you're you're sort of a victim of the page requirements. Um, so inherently, there's going to be a limit on the level of detail you can provide on, on your business model, on your financial model, on any of the technical or TEAs you have. So uh, if you want to include that information, it, it does show a level of robustness of, of your project. Uh, include a summary, include an output, a include a, a paragraph that details some of the outputs of these models. Um, that would be my recommendation, given the space constraint. Thanks, Artej. Um, other logistical questions. So who from the project proponent should actually register on SAM? Gov. Is that the prime recipient? Is that a subrecipient? Do they all have to register? How do you have any guidance on logistics or do we to refer back to the uh, the FOA and the, the SAMGov portal itself? Yeah, I think the easy rule of thumb is if you want to receive government funds, you need to be registered in SAM. Great. Great. So thank you for that. Um the uh there's a question about the distinction of companies based outside of, outside of the USA for, uh, versus projects here um, versus where the projects are going to be executed. Can we point folks to any guidance on the um, where the company has to be registered and where the project is, is registered? Yes, of course. Uh, so if you're an international company, you can apply as a, a U.S. subsidiary or partner with an existing business that's in the U.S. Um, if you are partnering, then that allocation of funding and, and the governance will need to be specified. Um, I would suggest that you do that. You engage in that uh, specification of governance as early as possible. Um, that is not necessarily a requirement for the concept paper. So in the concept paper, you're, you're defining the concept, you're introducing the, the project partners, um, and, and throughout the course of the full application phase, you will need to define the scope of who's doing what um, and work out the eligibility requirements as far as uh, if you need to be registered in the US and, and how that sort of interfaces with the project partners. Definitely refer to the FOA for official guidance on that. Yeah. The, the there's there is very clear guidance on what type of entity can be applying i would also say make sure you check specifically for which topic area you are applying to because it it is different for topic 1 compared to topic 2 and 3 and you know read the fine prints if you need to get a you know a legal opinion please consult uh, consult your your lawyer and legal counsel about uh, exactly whether 
uh, you qualify um, under those elements. Next one up here, and uh, this, Hartej, I'll let you take the first swing at this, and it starts to get into partners. So we're going to call Abigail up as well if you want to um, pile onto this one. And then we've got a couple more partner questions. Um, in the org chart, is that supposed to represent the, the, the prime proponent's full organizational chart or just the individuals involved in the projects, or does it show partners? Is there any... Uh, guidance that we can provide or point to related to the org chart? Yes, absolutely. It should be the key personnel involved in the project itself that you're, you're that you're proposing for funding. So that includes the project partners and uh, the prime uh, and their key personnel that will be involved in the project. It is not a full organizational chart of the corporation itself, uh, just the stakeholders that are relevant to the project. Great. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's that's helpful and would refer folks back to the evaluation criteria um, that, you know, talk about a, a, a competent, qualified, experienced management team. You know, you want to point to those folks on your org chart um, and then their, their relevant experience um, in, in as well. Um, would be happy to invite either uh, Abigail or Allison uh, if you'd like to um, jump on. So Al Allison, yes, welcome. Hi, Alison Kennedy from Boundary Stone Partners. Um, I just want to say with the concept paper, you really want to just highlight the key components of the project that like would make it successful and agreeing that like it's the org chart should be who is involved in the project. Like who will DOE call if there's a problem? Who will DOE call if they have a question? It's very much like you want to make it clearly defined. And if there are different partners, what their role is, who's the prime, who's really the lead on the project, who's responsible for what tasks of the project to make it as clear as possible. So DOE doesn't have questions when they're looking at like, oh, this is a massive problem that's happening. We don't know who to call. That's really, you want to know, who, they want to know who they're going to call. Yeah, it's the, you, you want to address the Henry Kissinger problem. Like, who do I call if I want to call Europe, right? So, you know, List the name Bob, Jane, Sally, who, whoever it's going to be, and, and it should be a you know the specific humans that uh, that are going to be leading as as part of the team. So, thank you very much, Allison, on uh, on that one. Um, so, Abigail, we've got a couple uh, that I think would be good for you to weigh in on here. Um, one in particular on on partnering is for folks that may be relatively small businesses that need to partner with other large industrial facilities, right? Like the qualifying facilities and owners that need to do this. Talk a little bit more about some of the matchmaking processes that I know that you and Breakthrough have been running as well as um, the DOE has a, a their own matchmaking element, but uh, what more can you say on matchmaking? Sure. So uh, we have at Breakthrough Energy tried to facilitate some of this matchmaking. Of course, uh, it is whatever networks we have, so it is not able to include everyone. And given the short timeline, uh, we know that's making this particularly difficult. Um, of course, uh, feel free to reach out um, if uh, you're still interested in trying to find a partner. Um, we, can, we can try our best. Um, we uh, really focused on uh, some of the technologies that we know, you know are in the Breakthrough Energy portfolio, as well as some others in our partner networks, and offered those to several of our uh, corporate partners, as well as other kind of larger organizations that deal with corporations, you know, trade associations, things like that, to see if there was any interest in a kind of list of technologies. Um, I would say that some other organizations that you could take a look at um, that kind of congregate, uh, you know, industrials, again, trade associations um, is one place to look that you can kind of at least hit, you know, one org that has many, um, many, many companies within their industry as, you know, one place to, to try to make a connection. Um, there are also uh, kind of groups of industries specifically around industrial decarbonization. There's the um, uh, I3, the Industrial Innovation Initiative, um, that has a mixture of different types of organizations, but some of those are uh, some of those large 
uh, corporates and folks with existing heavy industrial facilities. So that's one place to potentially look to, um, you know, solicit partnerships. Um, the Renewable Thermal Collaborative is another that would be really focusing around, um, you know, industrial heat and reducing emissions from those processes. So they have, you know, a membership as well of, of people who are interested in reducing emissions, um, you know, from their facilities in, in the heat kind of tech uh, category. So that would be uh, another organization that I would re recommend um, looking at. Um, so those are my my suggestions on on partnership this this late in the game, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Well, and and here's the other thing about partnership is remember this is a this specific grant program is a very rich grant program and it has a short timeline, but it is one of many many grant incentive. Uh, uh, programs that are out there and available um, to move ahead, and especially for the earlier stage types of technologies, uh, look at the full portfolio of what's available at, through through OSED and uh, DOE, um, because again, there there are truly hundreds of billions of dollars available, um, you know, with with this program. Um, and then, so there's a related question here um, about uh, the the TRL requirement and how strict is the requirement for TRL seven? Um, you know, if if a project has pilot demo and is ready to go to commercial, where where should that be? And um, you know, Hartej, maybe let you comment on this one from an eligibility perspective. Brian, thank you for the question. I think the most important thing is that your project is ready for commercial deployment. So, you know, I would focus less on the the, the TRL definitions, uh, and I would focus more on readiness for commercial deployment. So if you can point to a successful pilot demonstration that has already occurred successfully, uh, I think that's much more important than the specific TRL uh, rating. Uh, so that, that would be my my recommendation. Great, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Hartej. And um, the again, the FOA talks about um, the, again, the type and scale of ambition that they're looking for under this specific program. So I, I would encourage you to take a, a good, clear-eyed look at the FOA and where you are with your projects and technology. And, you know, you can make the go, no-go call uh, based on uh, how closely you, you feel your project uh, meets that definition. So uh, conscious on time here, we are down uh, to the, the waning few minutes. So I've got one more question in the queue, and that is uh, for Abigail. And I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's a nice question for us to wrap up on because it is looking forward to the actual construction phase, right? Like, so it, it turns out we've been talking about writing a 10-page concept paper um, for almost 90 minutes, and we got to go build stuff here, right? So um, the, these are major industrial projects that we're looking to encourage. So the, the question here, Abigail, is about um, as we look ahead to the phases of actual construction in the project, it says construction should begin by 2026. And what about some of the other dates around commercial operations, saleable products, uh, and, uh, and those different elements of the, the phases throughout the actual grant period? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, first, want to lay out the distinction again between topic one and topics two and three. So this uh, September 2026 deadline for start construction only applies to topics two and three because that is a function of the money going towards those two topics and uh, the legal requirements from the bill um, on how that money has to be spent. So again, the way that OSED has defined that is start construction by September 30th, 2026. Um, there is no uh, kind of hard deadline on actual um, kind of uh, actual start or kind of ramp up. You know, once you finish construction, you're actually producing a material. There's no hard or firm deadline on that. Um, that is something that would be negotiated um, with said uh, once awards are selected. Um, there will be a negotiation fate or negotiation process for each of the four phases that they lay out. And so that deadline would be negotiated. However, um, the 
other kind of specific funding deadline is start construction by September 2026, and all the money has to have been spent then in five years, so by September 2031. So that probably functions as a somewhat hard deadline on when things need to be, you know, completed. Um, all the money has to have been spent um, by September 2031. And then just again, topic one, um, $500 million through the bipartisan infrastructure law does not have any statutory limits on the funding. So OSED provides, you know, uh, I think like eight to 12 year um, estimated time horizon. There's no nothing legally actually um, requiring that. That's just their estimate. So if you know you have a project that may not quite fit in that window, still could be you know eligible in topic one. It's really topics two and three that have very strict um, eligibility around the funding because of uh, the legal language. Great. Thank you, Abigail. Really appreciate. Uh your expertise there on this one. So uh, with that, folks, we're going to wrap it to a close here. Um, this has been uh, uh, it, hopefully an extremely productive and informative uh, series. Hopefully you've walked away with a couple of uh, your questions answered, a little bit more information. And, you know, again, in closing, uh, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Amar and Kelly for providing their, uh, their perspectives and being here with us today. A uh, big shout out to Hartej and Hadia and Ed and Abigail and uh, for speaking here today. You can see our contact information here on screen. Um, please do reach out to us with, with further questions. Um, uh, again, if you have not filled out uh, our survey on this, uh, our survey helps us provide content like this and shape it to the areas that are most useful to you. Um, we are working hard uh, as RMI and with our partners at Breakthrough and ITIF and others across uh, uh, industry and across the NGO community to really truly drive industrial decarbonization. And so it's conversations like this, opportunities like this that um, are key elements. Um, look for more coming from us over the uh, coming weeks and months throughout the this very busy time of application periods for these grants for tax credits, for hubs, uh, for starting construction and hitting all those milestones on your projects like uh, uh, front end engineering design, breaking ground and, and ideally com commercial startup. i uh, tremendously grateful to all of you attendees who uh, have, have uh, been here today and uh, we will look forward to keeping the conversation going. So with that, we will close. I wish you all a great rest of your day, and we'll talk to you all soon. Bye now.